Hi, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Texas history, right? Really more specifically Texas geography and its first people. I'd like to welcome everybody to the course. There are some newcomers in here. Um, and I just wanted to get started just saying thank you for everybody that's joining us for this lecture and for this course. I hope we have a great semester. Um, on to a uh, matter of importance. Friday, we will be hosting our first history session on Zoom. And the link to that's gonna be posted on Blackboard. Please check that out. Uh, but that being said, let's just get moving on with this lecture. Again, thinking about Texas, it's, it's a really huge state. We talked about it in some of our workshops, thinking about Texas exceptionalism and how its size really becomes a part of the state's legacy and its exceptionalism across the United States and just in the world in general. But Texas is a very unique place because it also borders four different states. As of that, it also has one of the largest borders in the United States between Mexico and the United States. Um, so I just wanted to make, make people aware that Texas is so large that it borders its political borders, its state borders, also encompass its own type of history involved in that, and its own geography. Uh, but let's definitely move on because Texas also, its size also encompasses seven different regions that make up the state. One is the Panhandle Plains. The other one are the prairies and lakes, as you can see. Uh, then there's the Piney Woods, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, especially when we get to Anglo colonization in the state, talking about the Gulf Coast region. If some of you are not already read uh, Cabeza de Vaca's book or Andres Resendez's book, um, we're, they're definitely getting to talk about the Gulf Coast. Um, there's also the South Texas Plains, which is San Antonio is a part of. And you can see those plains all around the campus. Uh, and across the south side of San Antonio, everything below that too as well. But then we also have the hill country, which is north of San Antonio. And that goes all the way up to Austin, even further than that. And then we have the Big Bend area, which are the mountains of Texas. And since I'm a graduate of Utah at the University of Texas at El Paso, I spent plenty of time in El Paso where I saw a mountain right outside of my classroom, which is extremely amazing wasn't used to it at all, always freaking out the first year I was there about how large this mountain was and how significant it was, especially because I've never seen a mountain before uh, I moved there to El Paso. But that being said, as you will see in the readings and the regions, we're just home to different groups and different sets of people, plants and animals and regions and environments that all encompass Texas. Okay, so how did these environments get formed. Well, first we must start off with Pangaea. Um, it's, it's one of the more significant events in history that definitely plays a part into Texas's own history. And in order to get the different geographical regions of Texas, we must look further back into the supercontinent and its breakup. The state, was, as we see today, was part of the larger landmass and history of shifting environments leading to the spread of the continent. Okay, so it is during these changes that the environment that we see some of the most iconic historical characteristics of Texas. We see the mountains form, we see the plains form, uh, we see different plant life in different areas, but we also see the organic matter that we use as oil. And we're gonna talk about that more specifically in a bit. Uh, so, I mean, between the Jurassic period and the late Cretaceous period, uh, Texas is underneath a shallow sea. Uh, we can see we can still see parts of that today uh, with the shells that are across the hill country, even the mountain West Texas. And then we can also see this in the limestone deposits in the limestone that's more specifically in areas like San Antonio or part of the Ed Edwards Aquifer. Um, and the limestone deposits that come out of the sink sometimes because that's also a part of how Texas formed during that point in time and how we still see it today, but we also see it in the dead plant life that formed into the oil deposits that we have in the Permian Basin. And if you can see some of these images, uh, you can see that Texas definitely was a part of that shallow sea, but it cut that shallow sea cut through the middle of the United States and parts of Mexico and Central America. Uh, we also have life forms like ammonites and very unique stories. The fact that I used to 
see one all the time. My grandfather picked one up out of the Alamo quarry when he worked there in the 50s. And he just brought it to my grandma's house. And I didn't know what it was. I was a kid at that point in time. I didn't learn until I went to high school and in college, really about the Texas sea life even before Texas was Texas, the, the Texas that we know today. And I always thought that was just so amazing. I just wanted to share that story with y'all because, I mean, we still see this, this life that was here thousands and thousands and millions and millions of years ago still today. And we're going to get to how we still see that other resemblances of this later on in Texas or in Texas history. I mean, so one of these other things that we definitely see is our dinosaurs. And no, I'm not talking about Barney, even though, fun fact, he had his start in Dallas in the 1980s because that's where the creator formed him. Uh, but no, I'm talking about the dinosaurs that actually roamed Texas before human life, right? Um, and you can still see some of these dinosaur tracks today. I'm going to show you a brief map of Texas and all the different dinosaur sites that you can see them. One of them is outside of San Antonio, but if you can see in these images, you have the different dinosaurs and they look happy, but in all honesty, they're probably scary. Um, huge, huge animals that roamed Tex, parts of Texas and definitely across the United States and the Americas. Um, but you can still see their tracks today. There are some of the tracks that are still, that still exist, that are in preserves, that are in parks, that are in state parks in Texas. So, I mean, let's see some of these parks. So we have Dinosaur Valley State Park. So it's located southwest of Dallas. And here on the left-hand side, we can see the map of where all these dino, dinosaur tracks or dino tracks are located. But um, there's also some located right outside of San Antonio. If you've ever been to Government Canyon State Natural Area, you're going to see them right there. And there's signs that say, help save these dinosaur tracks from extinction. And I think it's, it's just something really interesting to um, show students, but also so st some of these students that are taking Texas history can show their students, especially when they um, teach or if they're going, just taking this class for fun. Um, it's something definitely to show just the future generation. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting. And it's always cool to talk about dinosaurs in Texas history. I think it's just fun. With that being said, let's go to when humans first came into Texas or to the Americas, really. And one of the general theories of how human life began or migrated into the United States or into the Americas in general was the Bering Land Bridge. And first humans traveled from Asia all the way over here, sometimes following animals, sometimes just um, following other people and involved in that kind of migration too as well. And there's two different methods that they came. One, they came through a land bridge itself. Others, they also came through the ice, the ice sheets that were forming, forming and dissipating and then forming again throughout the time. And this happened, this just didn't happen overnight. So it didn't happen in within a week or within a year. It happened over thousands of years. And we're going to talk about how, how they kind of lived in, in Texas. Right, as you can see in the arrows, these individuals and this map shows that these individuals moved from across the north to south, migrating and just like moving with either the animal herds or just moving to find new land or new territory or just to be a part of a community that they were with at that point in time. So some of the first people in Texas were the Clovis people which always is just a really interesting part of history. Like I was saying before, um, human, human, the human experience is also a part of the natural environment. And the way those interact is very, very, very much a part of how these first peoples interacted, right? So they're named the Clovis people, uh, named after the first site where they were spotted. And that first site is in Clo Clovis, New Mexico, on the border of Texas and New Mexico. And so that's why they named like that. But also because what they use were these spearheads called Clovis points. And they're a very unique type of weaponry used to hunt large megafauna in Texas and across the Southwest, across Mexico, across the United States. Um, and some of these animals were small and big in, in parts. So some of them were mammoths, mastodons, giant bison, giant armadillos, uh, ground sloths, 
large bison, horses, camels, sea turtles. And right here, you can see on the same time, sorry, bison was meant to be a beaver. And right here on the right hand side, you can see one of these giant beavers and how that compares to a human. And on the left hand side, you can see these shell looking things uh, or these bow looking things. But what those are were these giant armadillos uh, that that were a part of that megafauna here. So, I mean, these are just very large animals, but the reasons why these Cleobus people hunted these mammals was using these materials that they had, um, and they were easy to kill and easy to hunt um, in certain parts of the region. And so still today, we still see uh, these sites pop up where these individuals lived in the in Texas and some are barely are really really close to San Antonio some are a little bit further north others are a little bit further west or east but what we know is that these individuals lived a very unique lifestyle because they did hunt these large animals and the reasons why we know this is because of evidence we have these archaeological sites where we see the Clo Clovis people gathering these mammals, gathering these animals and butchering them, and sometimes um, camping in different sites across the area. So, I mean, that's where we start seeing some of these communities start forming. And there's other instances where you see sea turtles also being harvested by the Cleovis. So it suggests that these people were just not, not non-sedentary, but also sedentary. So they stayed in one place sometimes. So, I mean, these were unique individuals at this point in time. But what we see in Texas today, they were just scattered all across the region. Um, we also see in other ways that these people were hunters is through the remains of these bones that were butchered and killed on these campsites. This image is of the Cleobus Point stuck in the bone of a mastodon on the left-hand side. Although historians and archeology span archeologists know know more about the Cleos people today than when we first started. We are still discovering more about these people and their descendants I still do not know exactly where these early Texans went or how most of these animals became extinct. One theory is that the early Texans killed them to extinction. Other scholars say it might have been the changes in the weather and then in the climate and then the environment. Nevertheless, we know that humans and these animals lived together and survived alongside each other at one point in time. So that being said, let's move on, right? Not only are we looking at the first humans that inhabited Texas, but we're also looking at what they left behind. And so obviously we see the spearhead points. Other ways we can see pictures, right? Pictographs and rock art, which I always find fascinating because what you have to go through just to create these images on rock walls is just, it's just phenomenal. And in itself, it's just a painstaking labor for these individuals to go through from much later, from a much later time than the Cleovis people. So around 7,000 years ago, more people started to call Texas home. Some of them even created their own artwork to depict life during that point in time. And we're going to get into some of these uh, art pieces that these early inhabitants left. So, I mean, one of them that you have in your book is, is the white shaman. Um, but other ones that you don't have in your book are also the ones left at Waco Tanks, um, which is, again, a state park and historical site park. And it's in El Paso. Uh, has over 3,000 painted symbols on the rock in the park. And they're over 15,000 years old. Okay, and so you start seeing that People inhabited regions multiple different times. Many different people stayed there. Many people that did stay there found it very, very um, relevant to just post art. And so on the left-hand side, we see one of what looks like a deer. On the right-hand side, we see one that looks like a mask. And there's multiple uh, depictions of this one mask on in the cave art or just on other different masks in the cave art and faces in the cave art uh, that you can see in Waco tanks today. Another one is the white shaman and painted shelter which is in Comstock, Texas near Del Rio. 
on the Pecos River. And that's another thing that you're going to see is the fact that where some of these people are inhabited was also part of the natural environment. So they would inhabit places where they had access to water, had inhabit places where they had access to game and vegetation. And so we start seeing these communities form around these areas and we start seeing increased use of this art in these areas. And one of these areas is the, the Pecos River. Um, if you're from that area, it's called the Pecos River. Um, just a very Texas thing. Um, it's also one of the oldest examples of pictographs in North America. And what's incredible is, is that it's 26 feet long and 13 feet high. And at this point in time, when then when the people that created this artwork were alive, it was extremely hard to find some of these colors. It was extremely hard to find the animal fat that rendered some of these um, artworks. And so you start realizing that these inhabitants really want to make this artwork the best they could. And it's so large that they want it to be preserved. And so what scholars are barely grasping with today are what they actually mean, right? In certain instances, you can definitely see hunting grounds in some of these artworks. In other instances, you can see uh, ceremonies happening. And for this one right here, the white shaman, which is also depicted in your textbook, a Texas State University archaeologist by the name of Carolyn Boyd, after decades of research, believes that these images are the creation story of the people that first put them on the rock face. And this is an interpretation that has changed over time through herself. She has had multiple interpretations of the same artwork, but she has spent decades just researching this artwork because what it shows is an incredibly fluid life, an incredibly fascinating depiction of what people were thinking about and looking at at the time. So on the top one, you, on the top picture, you definitely see uh, the actual artwork. On the bottom picture was actually a rendition of the same artwork that she used through multiple different techniques of mapping, of carbon dating, of just different infrared scanners, just looking specifically at the artwork and what kinds of paint was used in that artwork. And so I think it's just incredibly fascinating to look at some of these early Texans and to see what they have they accomplished throughout the time, because I think it's just such a unique human feat. One, not only to live in these areas and to call Texas home, but also just to see what they left behind. And if that's not a part of history, I don't know what is. History is definitely what we leave behind as people, as humans in general, as the natural environment. Um, and sometimes there's documentation within that history that shows us what people left behind. And I think this is just one of those examples of what it, what's left behind in Texas history. This is the end of the lecture. It's a very short lecture. Uh, one, because I understand that you as students don't want to be sitting on a computer for an hour and a half or an hour straight just looking at one lecture and I just want to give the best experience possible. So we're going to do these lectures in a very short stint. They're not going to be long. They're maybe going to be 20 minutes, but I really wanted to show y'all what was it, what Texas looked like at the beginning, but also what some of the first inhabitants were doing at that point in time. And I just like talking about dinosaurs too. I think that's really cool. Um, but moving on to the next one, we're next lecture is going to be about colonization and the different indigenous groups in the state of Texas and how they meet in different areas a part of the state. Uh, so I just want you all to keep that in mind for the next lecture and I hope you have a great day. Thank you for joining this class. Uh, be on the lookout for certain announcements on Blackboard. Please email me if you need any information on the workshops or if you need any information on the Texas history textbook analysis. I'll be happy to help you. Um, I look forward to this semester and I look forward to the next talk. Thank you.